When we're young, we have an amazing positive outlook about how great life is going to be, but somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refused to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Good morning, everybody. How are we? Are we all good? Are we ready for a rocking and rolling show? Well, you're going to get one because we have got a guest today who has developed something that is quite simply a wow. Have you ever been to the doctor's or the dentist and had to have an injection? That is not good news at any time. And even though you look away, the pain is still dreadful. And I suppose, is it the anticipation of having a shot that hurts or is it the fault of it or is it the actual needle entering the body that does the damage? Well, whatever it is, without a doubt, it's a fear that affects both children and adults. Now, after training as a paediatrician, our guest realised while seeing her children distressed, it was up to her to control the pain in a harmless, friendly way. So she set to work and developed a multifaceted pain relief tool, Buzzy, which has taken the world by storm. So let's start discussing how Buzzy came about and let's find out how many variations of the product have been developed on the way to this huge success and has the success been something that has delighted her or just taken her away from her original life purpose and into the world of entrepreneurial ventures well I have no idea but I'm going to find out as we bring onto the show to start joining up the dots of her life and of course Buzzies the one and only Amy Baxter how are you Amy I'm great thank you so much David for having me It's lovely to have you here. And can I, do I call you Dr. Amy or Professor Amy? Is it just Amy? What what do I address you as? Um, Dr. Amy is what more formal people prefer and Amy is just fine. So you decide where you line up on that particular line. I might change if the conversation's getting a bit edgy. I might I might change to doctor. So I, I see how we go on that. You're 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 in Atlanta at the moment, and as we were sort of touching base on before the show, it's belting hot out there at the moment. I imagine. Um, you know, as they say, it's not the heat; it's the humidity. You can put your plants outside and forget to water them, and the atmosphere does the job. So it's a little swimming pool soup out in the Atlanta atmosphere right now. And have you, have you always lived in Atlanta? Because I, I spent a very pleasant weekend in Atlanta. I went on a road trip a few years ago and the snow was horrendous. My listeners will have heard this story many, many times. Um, and we got to Atlanta and it was like a, it was only two days we had sun. And I remember standing in uh, Martin Luther King's back garden and actually feeling some heat on my head for the first time in two weeks. And I thought, this is heaven. Um, do you think it's heaven? Is it a place that you, you, you love living? Have you always lived there? So many questions. I'm excited about Atlanta. <laughs> oh, we, we adore living in Atlanta. I was born and raised in Lexington, Kentucky, and my family moved to Atlanta when I went to college. So I went as far north and far away from home as I could and then realized the error in my ways and came to medical school in Atlanta. So I've moved around for training, but I met my husband in Atlanta and we came back here just about as soon as all of our medical training was done. And what 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 would appeal to people to come to Atlanta? You've got the world's biggest fish tank. I remember that. You've got something to do with Coca-Cola. I remember seeing that as well. But what's the sort of main things that would drag people into Atlanta? You know, Atlanta, I'm glad you had such a great experience visiting because I think it's not the best city to visit. It's hard hard to get access to all of the cool things and they're sort of spread around but it's a marvelous place to live because there are so many trees and so many pocket neighborhoods that are nonetheless close to culture we can go to the opera we can go to the symphony we can go to enormous numbers of venues to hear rock and roll and ska and um, crazy things and all of it is very compact when you live inside the city so we have a tiny grocery store we walk to and I never fail to see someone I know there. So it feels like living in a small town, even though we're in the middle of the biggest uh, airport, the highest density airport in the world. Did you like being in the shop and seeing people that you know? Because I, I don't like it, actually. I, I find it very uncomfortable. If I see someone that I know, I will zip round into some aisle that is quite obvious I'm not supposed to be in there just to sort of disappear. It depends what I'm buying. And usually this particular grocery has the best selection of IPAs. So I'm almost always going in buying beer. I feel like I'm being seen by neighborhood children when I'm making a vice run. So um, (laughs) 
fortunately, I guess beer is not the worst of vices, but, <laughs> but it, it, uh, it is funny. I think that my entire neighborhood knows my, my preference for beer. In fact, there was a child down the street who had a sore throat and I'm often asked to go and do quick, uh, pop in doctor visits for the neighborhood children. So when I looked at his throat, I was pretty sure that he had mono and not strep. And um, sure enough, the family got him tested. And as a thank you on my front porch, in his little six-year-old writing, he said, thank you, Dr. Amy, for making me feel better. And uh, he left me a six-pack of beer. <laughs> that is the perfect client, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so um, so I, I hopefully he didn't purchase it himself, but uh, but it's not bad to be known for what you like. No, absolutely. That, that's that's what we all want in life. So, so do they know you as sort of Buzzy Baxter now? Is 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 Buzzy? Because I, I want to touch on that because it's obviously the big part of getting you on the show. But are you still Doctor Baxter? Has Buzzy sort of become an identity on its own? You know, David, there's an interesting story. I I self identify most as a scientist and a researcher, and I'm asked often to go give lectures on pain or sedation or the medical things that I do. I went to Rochester. New York and was asked to do grand rounds, which is what they call it when you're you're teaching um, the medical staff at one big lecture in the morning. Usually they'll have them once a week or once a month. So I was invited up and the director of pediatrics stuck out his hand and when I went to shake it, he went Bzzz! and he said, ah, got the B, I bet you get that a lot. Um, it was the first moment that I realized that my life as an academic was completely going to be overshadowed by a vibrating bee. I, I'm still not 100% comfortable with it, although um, my husband and I talk about what we're going to have on our tombstones, and, and I think I'm just going to have my epitaph be a, an image of a bee and an image of a, a, a throwing up face, because my other big research claim to fame was making a, a barf scale for children with cancer who have nausea. So I'm just going to have two icons and and no words on my tombstone. I I I think I would just have I told you I was sick. I, I saw that somewhere, <laughs> and I think that's perfect, isn't it? My husband wants leash your pets. Yes, yeah. We, we this is the greatest show I've ever had. We could spend all day <laughs> talking about gravestones. But did did you really want to be an entrepreneur? As as you sort of said there, it seemed to hint that the fact that Buzzy has taken away from an area that you was obviously trained and passionate. Is that a real positive thing? Or is there a little bit of you that thinks, oh, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time in board meetings and, and meetings with people that isn't really my thing? You know, I was in a meeting yesterday and they brought up the concept that um, what are you most proud of? And then a little later they said, what is the hardest thing for you to do? And I think that it's not as simple as, is this the path that I meant to go on and am I happy being here? I think the answer is that often what you're most proud of is what is the hardest to do. So there are a number of areas where I'm outside my comfort zone on a daily basis. And while that's hard, it is certainly stimulating and and I feel more rounded. I and I, It's a perfect time to bring it up. You know, In retrospect, when I join up my own dots, I have always been entrepreneurial. I, I sold things door to door. I did a program called Junior Achievement when I was in high school, being a president of a company, selling things door to door. And even when I was at uh, undergraduate at Yale, I started a school supplies company. So I've always had this bit of entrepreneurial industry in me, but I... I negated it. And I was like, you know, even though I have this, maybe it's a backup, but medicine is where I want to be. And then after I finished medical school, I ended up working for a test prep company as their brand manager for a year, just because I felt like I was going to be better able to, to tell them how to communicate to medical students and teach what they needed to know. So there's been this, this series of dots laid through the medical profession and while I didn't intend to go here I certainly have had times in my past where I feel like I was better trained than most doctors to do what I'm doing. So when you went into the medical profession was that your path was that your passion or was that something that was kind of expected to you because a lot of the conversations that I have with people they openly hold their hands up and go yeah I Probably the first 10, 15 years, I was doing stuff that was expected of me. It wasn't really my true passion. Are you different from that? Was, was medical 
you, your thing. Yeah, medical is my passion, and it still is. Um, honestly, I love being a know-it-all, and having a really difficult field, which is useful to everybody, was very appealing. Being able to go, ah, yes, you can eat that, or no, don't touch your eyes after you've touched that. Um, I like that, and I so I was always drawn to that. I remember it around age four, I would get a bottle of mercurochrome, which is the, the red stuff that you used to put on cuts. Oh, yeah. And and sit outside my front stoop hoping somebody got hurt so I could be the one to save the day. I think I've always had a really big um, desire to be the one who has a cool head in a crisis and save the day and come forward with the solution that's going to make someone suffer less. So medicine was was clearly the place that I wanted to be from a very, very young age. My father is a life insurance salesperson, and so he really wanted me to go into the family business I don't think he's disappointed with my path, but but I was all queued up um, in the family mind to to be a salesperson, and instead deviated because medicine was really where my heart lay. So, what was it? Was there a firm path in medicine? Because I don't know much about medicine. To me, one doctor's the same as the other, and I don't mean that sort of rudely. It's just kind of the way it is. Um, did you actually have to decide on what path in medicine you wanted to be? Or do you go into like general practitioner, first of all, and then move on to different things afterwards? Right. So different countries do it differently. And the the practice in the U.S. is that you spend four years of undergraduate doing about half of it pre-medical to learn the science basics. And then you go into four years of medical school. The first two years, you're learning more science. And the second two years, you're dabbling in rotations, they're called. So you try a bit of ophthalmology. You try a bit of general medicine. You try a bit of pediatrics. You try emergency. You try all of these things. And at the end of those four years, you've either shown an aptitude in one or you've decided that you hate all of them except. And that's how you make your decision. I really enjoyed surgery, and I had actually gone to meet with the head surgeon at Emory Medical School, and I was ready to sign on the dotted line. I was ready to work the rest of my life, staying awake every fourth night. I was ready to, to eat bitter, as they say, to, to, to live the pain that is the training for being a surgeon and the demands that it puts on your life the rest of your life. And uh, the guy didn't show up. <laughs> He stood me up. And so I was I was so appalled that I went home and told my my now husband what had happened. And um, and he said, well, you know, I wasn't going to say this before your meeting, but that sounds like a lifestyle that doesn't fit with the, the joie de vivre and the the travel and the other things you like to do. Have you thought about being a pediatrician? And I said, oh, you've got to be kidding just playing with kids all day, sitting around, wiping noses, um, figuring out whether or not they're, they're walking when they should be, playing with kids all day. I can't imagine doing that for medicine. And he slowly looked at me and he said, yeah, playing with kids, what a hard life. <laughs> and, and that was a real um, adjustment. I think that I, I had never contemplated in my training what life was going to be like doing what I trained for. I think that I had only thought about the aspects of being in training and getting to that point, but not living that life. So when he said that, I, I started thinking about being in pediatrics. And I still liked emergencies, and I still liked the urgent things, and I liked fixing stuff. I liked having a cut that was wide open and scaring everyone and then being able to make it look nice and tidy and sewn up. I like bridging the gap and teaching. So having every parent come into the emergency room terrified and being able to, to talk them off the ledge and let them know the reasonable amount of fear they need or why they don't need to be afraid at all, that is really satisfying. So when I decided to go into pediatrics, it was with a definite intention of then going on to emergency pediatrics, which is what I did. And do you look back at all at surgery and think to yourself, ah, oh, I still got that, that feeling that, that it wasn't the right decision. It, it's panned out well, but oh, surgery, get my hands inside somebody and rip things out. <laughs> no, I'm, whoo, dodge that bullet. <laughs> that would have been such a bad call. No, I'm, I'm very grateful that I was stood up on that fateful day. I've, I've, before we start talking about buzzing and stuff, I've got a friend called Claire. If you're listening, Claire then you shouldn't be listening. You should be at work. But she is a, hi, Claire. Hi, Claire. She's a, she's a nurse. 
and I spend all my time saying, what's the weirdest thing you've seen? What, what you know, what is really strange stuff? Because I'm kind of fascinated by the by the weird, freaky stuff. And I'm going to ask you, Amy, don't worry, no one's listening and you don't have to say any names. But what, what what's the weirdest kind of body thing that you've seen that's really kind of taken you by surprise? Oh, there's awesome stuff. All right. So first of all, bot flies. Bot flies are a, a fly. It lives in tropical climates. And every so often someone's traveled to Africa or to places where they're endemic. And the bot flies plant larva in your skin. And so you'll have a little thing that looks like it's a zit, and then it looks like it's got to be a boil. And and when they come into the emergency department with them, we can cut them open, and there's a worm inside. Ew, that's awesome. Buzz, that's a buzz, and what they call butt flies. Bot fly, B O T F L Y. Oh, bot fly. Oh, B O T T. I thought it was B U T T. I thought it was um. No, no, just one T. Just B O T F L Y. Okay, yes. right. That, that that's warming me up. That's pretty weird, but there must be something better out there, Amy. Well, someone had a bike wreck, and they accidentally the the brake of their bike disconnected, and they cut their leg um, at the same time as the bike brake slid into their calf. And so on the x-ray, they, they had a break in their leg, but the bone was fine. They just had an actual bike break stuck in their leg. Um, That's a great joke, isn't it? <laughs> Nobody thought it was funny until maybe a day or two later, I'm sure. But um, When you lift it up and say, yeah, you've got a break in your leg. I can see it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly. Perfect. That's perfect. Um, right. Although I want to spend all day talking about this, I'm aware that people might be listening, having their breakfast. So um, I, I, I think we're all right, well, here, I'll tell, I'll tell one breakfast one. OK, go, go, it for, it, go for it. Won't be gross. Um, so I did my residency in Cincinnati and I did a child abuse fellowship in Cincinnati. And when I was working in the emergency department, one very cold winter morning, a a woman brought her five year old boy in with the complaint of lost testicles. And um, it turns out, she said, I, they were there last night when I was giving him a bath. And this morning, they're gone. <laughs> Couldn't find them anywhere. So I found them for her. But, um, but that was one of the, the most humorous things that I'd ever had to see around a breakfast time in cold, wintry Cincinnati. I, I know people that could build a whole career on that story. <laughs> you could dine out on that one and it would never get boring. Well, I, there's uh, there's flourishes and embellishments, but for the sake of your breakfasting listeners, I decided I would forgo those. Absolutely. So so let's get on to Buzzy, because Buzzy interests me. So for, for people who don't know what Buzzy is, it is a kind of cartoon bee that goes onto your skin. I've, I've done a bit of research, and hopefully I've done this right. And it will vibrate, and it is cold. And it does something to the nerve endings so you don't actually feel an injection going in. Is that about right? Yes, well done. Well done. So it, it, um, we have them in plain black for the adults, but people tend to like the bee. And in South Africa, we have uh, a lady buzz because I guess killer bees in South Africa make the even a cheerful cartoon bee a little bit more intimidating. The, the physiology of what it's doing is really not miraculous. It's, um, it's something we all take for granted. If you burn your finger... What do you do to make the burned finger feel better? Run it under a tap. Right. And does warm water work or cold? Cold. cold. Right. So, so the reason that pain disappears when you run cold water on a burn is because the pain nerves that transmit burning pain and needle pain and itching and almost every sharp pain, it's a very thin, small nerve. And it runs side by side with big, fat, fast nerves that transmit motion and with slower nerves that transmit cold sensations. So if you add enough cold and motion, then it overwhelms that tiny little pain nerve, and so it effectively blocks it out. And you do this all the time. If you bump your elbow, immediately you'll start rubbing it. You give those big, fat vibration nerves a stimulus, and then you don't feel the tiny, sharp pain nerves. Because it's, this sounds kind of obvious to me. Well, when you say that, I kind of think, why... Why has it taken so long for somebody to create this? And why for years and years and years, decades probably, we've just been going, right, wince, look the opposite way and, and have it rammed in us? You know, I think, um, ironically, that 
the the biggest growth we're having with Buzzy is actually for for aches and pains. You know, the things that you do take for granted. If you're going to ice an injury, then icing it with massage is even better. And Buzzy can strap in place so your ice pack doesn't come off. You know, the uses that people are using it for now are certainly not why I designed it. I think it just doesn't occur to people that you can intervene with medical procedures. We're sort of used to going to the doctor and and, and just taking it and doing whatever we need to, or they do that to us. But it doesn't occur to us that we could intervene in something like needle pain. So I think that until I had a real reason to come up with a solution for my own children, um, it didn't occur to me either that there has to be a way to make shots not hurt because we're just so used to taking it for granted. When, when people who are born before 1983 certainly in the U.S., but also in the U.K., um, we didn't get very many shots. And so consequently, we don't have as much of a fear of needles as do children now, because children now get 36 shots. And before, we would only get six shots, and we got them before we were two years old. So, so most of us figure we probably got as many shots as our own kids, but it didn't bother us, so we don't get why it bothers kids today. So I think the need for Buzzy, if if in my own research, um, if people only get two injections on one day, they end up not as likely to be afraid of needles as they grow up. They do handle it. It's, it's when you start getting three, four, five injections on one day, that's what triggers the fear. That's what tips people over into having a memory that affects whether or not they go to healthcare. So I think the, the long answer to your question is um, nobody came up with it because we didn't really need it before. There weren't enough people that disliked injections to do it, and and it was hard to imagine that we could control medical pain because that's not the way the medical system is usually set up. I, I'm thinking about myself, and I think I probably have had about six injections. Like I, I was born in 1970, and I imagine that I had some when I was little, and I remember being a teenager and having one in my arm for something or other, which then people would go around and punch you to make sure it, <laughs> it's swelled up afterwards. Um, but, yeah, I don't think I've had anywhere near 36. So what's going in, on in America now that they're sort of they're doing that many? Well, and it's actually going on in the UK and Canada as well. Um, it's just that that we're calculating the risk benefit of each individual vaccine, and there hasn't been a good reason to look at it in context. So, if you just get, um, if you if you see that you can stop chickenpox, then you do the math and you say, okay, well, we've had twelve children die this year from chickenpox and six thousand hospitalized. If we vaccinate everyone, that goes down to one death and 20 hospitalizations. So even though it costs a lot to vaccinate the world, um, it still costs less than it does to hospitalize all those children and have 11 deaths. So with every vaccine, um, and they're getting easier to make, and they're also such a tiny amount of, of immunologic load, the risks are getting very small. So in calculating the risk benefit, it's like, well, gosh, what's bringing kids to the emergency room? Um, ear infections. Let's get a pneumococcal vaccine that will dramatically, de dramatically decrease pneumonia and ear infections. And it does. They work. I mean, the, the vaccine preventable diseases have dropped 99 percent since the 60s when we started vaccinating. It, it is amazing, the public health benefit. But when I talk about in context, um, because when you get four shots at once, it's very different from getting one. And when you're little and you're held down, it can overwhelm. And so there's a, a very big qualitative difference between getting two shots at once and getting five. So I think that, that we haven't yet adequately looked at the health effects of that qualitative difference. And so looking at that qualitative difference and seeing, okay, Maybe we have all of these deaths that are prevented because of, of an individual vaccine, but now parents are feeling like they need to pick and choose. They're saying, yeah, four just seems like too many. So which of these am I going to decide, not having a medical background, by looking at the Internet, which ones am I going to not take? And so we're really jeopardizing some of the, the big killers and some of the protection unless we look at what happens with all of these injections in context. Did you still need to have injections? Can you not make something that you just drink? Well, your stomach acid breaks down almost anything that you give. Um, there's some 
really great progress in intranasal vaccines because you've got direct access to the blood flow when you sniff. So there's a flu mist, so you can get a flu injection, a flu vaccine now that's inhaled. There's some wonderful progress looking at microneedles and being able to to get it under the skin, but with such tiny mosquito-like probes that it doesn't hurt. But unfortunately, the molecules that make up vaccines are fairly fragile. And so to get them where they need to be so the body can recognize it and say, oh, I, if I see this again, I'm going to squatch it immediately. Um, that has to be something that doesn't pass through our other defenses. And the stomach and anything you take by mouth is a great defense and breaks down some of those fragile molecules. It's fascinating. I'm learning so much here, Amy. I'm going to be the king of pain when I go back to my house tonight <laughs> with my kids. Because when, when my kids were little, I, it was always me that had to take them to the doctors for the injections because my wife didn't like to see them distressed, where I kind of thought, well, they need it, so I'm the one to hold them down. And I, I remember that. I, I remember taking my daughter with her little fat arms and just sort of lifting up her top and bang straight into her. And it, it's not pleasant, is it? It's not pleasant for the baby or the adult actually sitting there well if you think about it there is no other situation in medicine where we systematically cause pain there there isn't any situation where a a physician intentionally causes pain and we're spending all of our energy as parents protecting these tiny little defenseless babies it's of course it's uncomfortable and it's unpleasant now fortunately in the research we did the Injections that you get and the number before age two weren't correlated with fear later on. Um, again, you're a little too little to remember it in a way that it's going to affect your future decisions. But when you're older, when you're four to six years old, that's actually the age that most phobias start because you're old enough to remember, but you're too young to do anything about it. So the control feeling is gone. So, so has it surprised you how many adults are freaked out? Because I. I, I did research on you and it surprised me because I just thought, oh, once you're an adult, you just put up with it and that's it. But it's a big problem for adults as well, isn't it? What's really interesting to me is that um, it's changed, that in 1995, it was only about 10% of adults that had enough of a fear of needles that they wouldn't go to the doctor. Now, even then, 10% is enormous. 10% is more people than are afflicted by insomnia. Um, it's dramatically more people than get affected by cancer every year. So it's a huge number of people. And yet, I think that we don't pay attention to it as physicians because if you're afraid of needles, you don't go to a physician. So it's not something we see a lot. But since 95, the, the incidence of this fear has increased to almost a quarter of adults. In fact, there was a study looking at flu vaccines that found that the the Adults who did not get a flu vaccine, a quarter of them didn't do it because they were afraid of the needle. So I think that it's it, there's so much shame involved. You know, it's like everyone punching your arm. Um, you're supposed to man up and take it. And there is a pride in being able to handle pain well. And so there has to be the other side of the coin, which is a shame if you don't handle pain well. And for many people, 5% of people who are afraid of needles, they get lightheaded, they get nauseous, and that's actually genetic. It's a, it's a physiologic response that's hardwired. You tend to grow out of it around age 50. The, the thought is that this, it's called vasovagal, but the thought is that that, that fainting urge happens um, in case you're attacked by a sword or some other Neanderthal, and then you don't want to lose blood, so your body passes out quickly so that you're flat, so that you don't lose as much blood and your brain keeps as much blood flow. Um, again, sorry for the breakfasting people, but, but they think that that's probably why that response tends to get better after people are past childbearing age. After 40 or 50, that response goes away, but, but a full 5% of people who are afraid of needles, um, sorry, 5% of the population, they they have this genetic response. So it's not a weakness or something to be ashamed of. It's actually just inborn. you still got to man up, though, haven't you? <laughs> you know, this was really cool, actually, um, because I, I get so often people say, you know, life is pain and you just need to deal with it. Um, it turns out that when the, the children in our study who went multiple times for injections but got no more than two at a time, they actually had lower fear than the people who just went once, but they got four at the same time. 
So, so there's a concept called adverse childhood events. And it's, it's stressors that cause what they call toxic shock. It's something that's so stressful that it overwhelms you. And that leaves an emotional memory that affects future decisions. Um, it affects health. Google it. Adverse childhood events. It's, it's totally a thing now. Uh, what I think may be happening is that um, a little pain over and over again does give you the resources to cope. And it does make you better able to deal with pain. And... Um, you go forward and you're fine with it. You know, almost anyone who is diagnosed young with diabetes, they may be afraid of needles initially, but, but almost everybody by a year, they've, they've gotten to the place where it's not a big deal to them. I think that when you only have a, a few exposures to the doctor and you have a, an overwhelming event, that that's very different than having um, a small bit of pain multiple times. It's like if you got stung by one wasp in your garden, you're not going to not go in the garden. But if you're a small child and you get stung by five wasps, you may be less likely to be a gardener when you get older. Because I, I discovered that I got some kind of immunity to wasps. And I found it out in Graceland, Elvis's house. And it was it's really, I'd never up to my, in my knowledge, I had never been stung in my life. But now I think maybe I had been stung, but I just kind of blanked it out. And I was going into Graceland's and I took my sunglasses off because it was sort of sunny outside and dark inside. And the crook of my arm, as I bent it, there was a hornet there and it stung me. And my whole arm went up like Popeye within about five minutes. And by the time I came out, it totally gone. So, so do some people have like an immunity to injections? Do they not actually feel the pain? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we're finding out that, that there are definitely different levels of sensitivity. Redheads are more likely to feel pain. Uh, people with ADHD are more likely to be really sensitive to light cutaneous touches. So I think that um, it's one area where there's a great opportunity for more research because there do seem to be very different sensitivities. African-American kids are much less likely uh, to, feel as, uh, to feel needles as intensely. And so I think it's a, a thicker skin. It's a less, the stratum corneum is what it's called, but that layer is a little thicker. So certainly there are different sensitivities to, um, to pain. I think that most of what happens with, with fear of needles, though, is that it's an event you may be predisposed because you have very thin skin or you're um, sensitive to, to light touch or you're redheaded, but it's how you deal with it. Because there, there are lots of great studies that show that if a child or an adult has a scary experience, but the parent reassures them, distracts them, lets them know that all is well, and they don't get overwhelmed, that that's an empowering experience. So I think pain control is a part of it, but it's not the end-all and be-all. But to your question, yeah, there's definitely different sensitivities. Some people just, they don't get lightheaded, they don't get nauseous, and they don't even really feel it. So in the introduction, I said, is it the ante anticipation of having a shot that hurts? Is it the fault of it? Or is it the actual needle entering the body that does the damage? And it seems to me it's, it's more mental than anything then, is it? Yeah, it's very multifactorial, and it depends on whether or not you're someone who is sensitive to fainting or not. But um, what they found is that the people who get lightheaded or nauseous, their anxiety goes up so high, their blood pressure goes up, and then the needle makes the blood pressure drop. So it's that, it's that change. It's the difference between the high and the low that causes them to feel sick. But after a couple times of that, then the anxiety and the fear going into it is what becomes worse. And that's part of why what we found with Buzzy is that it works better when the families are bringing it with them because the kids know they have something they can trust. The adults know that they're less likely to pass out. And that kind of um, empowerment and that kind of secret weapon makes them less anxious. Because you're absolutely right. The, the fear that goes into it is um, at least a third. There's, there's three parts to the experience of pain. There's the actual physical pain. There's how afraid of it you are. And then there's how much attention you're paying to it. So, so while Buzzy is great if, at blocking out the sensations of the needle going in, if you're already anxious, you're going to feel that light touch. Um, we have kids who scream when you clean off their, their arm with the, the alcohol swab. 
So for those guys, it's really important to also bring their attention to something else so that their, their fear is lessened and they're concentrating on counting or finding or looking or doing something that's not, that's not involved with the needle. And, and that's true for any pain. If you're at the dentist, it's much better to, to be counting ceiling tiles or to be looking away or to stimulate, you know, pinch your finger so that you're paying attention to that sensation and not paying attention to the place where the pain's going on. Because I can't look at it going in my arm, I'll be honest. Um, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated to see how much blood I'm producing or something like that. <laughs> but actually, I always look away and it seems to do me. But some other people just need more and more. So does Buzzy come in different sizes? Is it, is it one size fits all? So the, the strength of the motor is the same in all of them, but we made a mini that is easier to put in your hand. For the people who are doing arthritis shots or, or Lovenox or something where they have to give themselves shots and they have to bunch up their stomach or their thigh, um, the mini is small enough to fit in the heel of the palm so that they can have the buzzy in place at the same time as they're using their fingers to bunch up the skin while they give the injection for the other. Um, for people that are using it for for IVs, for blood draws, or for aches and pains, we have one that has a slot through it. And that, you can put a Velcro strap or a tourniquet in a hospital, and it'll stay on the area as long as you need it. So for um, if you're putting it on for, for an overuse injury, a tennis elbow or a carpal tunnel, then you can just strap the vibration and cold right on where it hurts and leave it on for 10 minutes, just the same way you would ice something it's just you can add the massage to the icing. So there are those two different units. So the, the tourniquet slot or the tourniquet ready and then the mini. Um, people that are using Buzzy for Botox or that are injecting, doctors can use the mini because, again, it fits well enough into the heel of the hand that you can still use your other hand to inject whatever needs to be injected, but the mini is in the right spot. But if it needs to be for, for a blood draw and it needs a tourniquet, then the tourniquet ready. And we have three different designs, like I said. We've got the plain black one, if you're too cool for a bee. We have the, the striped bee, and then we have the, uh, the ladybug. And what's that? Like, like the old Pac-Man? It's got a bow in her hair or something, is it? <laughs> she just looks like a ladybug. Um, we, we had for a while a, uh, a, a very limited edition of 50 polar bears. We called them Stephen Cold Bear. But... Uh, the the comedian said that under no circumstances could we sell it as Stephen Cold Bear. So we just we had a little shivering polar bear for a while, and uh, now we just are sticking to our lady buzz, our bee, and our our buzz black. I I I just think this is a genius idea, and I just I keep on coming back to that first statement I made. It's amazing that no one did this years and years and years ago. Well, I really uh, my my dream. I was actually interviewed earlier this morning by my, my, my alma mater and they asked what what is my dream and my dream is that that everybody has some version of buzzy in their medicine cabinet because it's such obvious physiology just just using it for splinters using it for an ache using it for i, I pulled a muscle this morning and put it on the muscle for 10 minutes i think that that once we understand that this is an obvious way to to combat pain, it ought to be something that's just a, an easy go to without having to take medications, without having to take drugs, and it's reusable. I I'm hopeful that this is something that really changes the way people feel like they can approach pain. That we really feel like we can take pain control in our own hands. What well, was it instantly? You know, right? Did you just go right? We need it to be cold. We need it to buzz. Or did you try sort of loads of other things? on its development? Well, the first ones were made in my basement. Um, so I had, I took apart a lot of uh, cell phones to see how they vibrated. I actually went to an adult toy shop to take apart some of their, um, their massagers because you said that I, very nicely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, because I, I was a doctor. I, I didn't know how to make a an electrical device that, that vibrated. I didn't even know. So it turns out that a, a an eccentric flywheel on a motor, so you just have a, a lump of metal that's off center. And so it spins from the center of a motor, but because it's not, because um, it's all concentrated on one side, it makes the vibration. I didn't even know that. So So the first prototypes I had, we went through about 16 maybe different prototypes of various types. Um, 
and so at first I also didn't know the best way to get vibration to the skin. You know, one of the things that um, people ask me is, well, why can't I just go use a massager and an ice pack? And I tell them to go for it. There, there's really, it has to be a really fast vibration, but, but otherwise there's really nothing magical about this. It's just compact and it's a little bit more effective because what we found was the concave shape is better for nerves. Nerves aren't like a string or a straw. They're really like a fan. And so to get the best blocking of pain, you need to block as many of these tiny little fanned out pieces as you can. So so the buzzy is curved and the ice pack fits underneath it and it curves too so that it's touching more of the skin. But when I started, I, I have one version that had these three little prongs because I was trying to concentrate the vibration through these prongs. Um, it also happened to buzz like a buzz saw, and it scared the cat. But <laughs> but I did go through a lot of different versions. There was a, a a design company in Atlanta called Formation, and I took them my little electrical tape soldered thing that I'd made in my basement, and they were the ones who really took it and said, you know, that's great, but this this needs to be cute. And they were the ones who came up with the the beautiful, adorable design of Buzzy. Uh, if I do say so myself, he's quite cute. And the Lady Buzz, and they have been the ones who made it um, more attractive and also fit in the hand. Part of the, the top of Buzzy is curved so that it will fit easily into the palm of your hand while you're pressing it on the skin. Did you realize we started off this conversation talking about your drink habit and... <laughs> And all the beer. And then we've gone into adult toys. You're, you're going to be known as that doctor, aren't you, from now on? You, you, you know that doctor who walks around with beer and adult toys all the time? <laughs> uh, it definitely hasn't affected my pediatric practice yet, but I'm sure that day is coming. Yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, what I want to do, I, I, I've been grappling whether this fits into this show or not, but I'm, I'm fascinated to know your point of view on it anyway. I'm going to play the speech by Steve Jobs, because we normally do that, um, and I just want to see whether you think it is relevant to your life, because your life seems to be quite on a path that is designed by yourself. Um, I'm going to play these words, and then I'm going to ask you afterwards. This is Steve Jobs. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. So is that true for you, Dr. Amy, or has your life been designed, as I say? Oh, it's unquestionably a, a, a retrospective connecting of dots. But I, I think that, that one of the things that Steve Jobs says is, is a very attitudinal thing. Um, you can only connect the dots if you decide to embrace them and to accept them and not to regret the places where you went or the decisions that you made. When when you look at your life and you you are open to everything you've done and you don't regret it you accept that that's part of your path that's part of what brought you to where you are then it's much easier to to claim the dots and to connect them i think that the the part that derails some people is is looking at a situation or a relationship or a an opportunity that they missed and feeling like it's wasted time, feeling like it's something that um, was lost, when in fact everything that you do becomes a dot that propels you to your future success if you embrace it for what you got out of it. It's a very attitudinal distinction, but if, if Steve Jobs had... Um, regretted that he took graphic arts and calligraphy classes, then he never would have embraced taking that into the importance of design when he made his products. So, so I think part of connecting the dots is not regretting that the decision that you made or the job you've done for the last two years was wasted time. In no way, even if I end up not practicing medicine, in no way do I regret at all what I learned and what I did, because the discipline, the insight, the, the point of view that I got from that was integral to what I'm doing now. 
it's critical to me to to not waste that training. There are so few slots, and there are not very many people trained to do that. So it it's a moral imperative to use that training in whatever I do going forward. So it's not lost time. It's not a derailment. Um, really, you've got to cherish all of those experiences that you did, because if you hadn't, you wouldn't be who you are now. Nothing is wasted in your life is if you choose to make sure that that experience either is a positive and you take it with you, or if it's a negative, you learn and not do it again. Right. I, I think that, by definition, regretting means that you would do differently now. And so if you hadn't had that experience, there's no way that you could appreciate at the time why you shouldn't have done something. You know, you can't have the sensation of 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 regret or realizing that something was a mistake until you've actually done that experience. So it's, uh, it's sort of tautological. And, and I think it's, it's regret is a waste of emotion because taking what you learned, you're a different person. So one of the things we talk about um, is the big dot. In most people's life, there is a big dot. It's that, that crossroads. It's that point in their life that actually takes them on the path that leads to success, fulfillment, or just a better place. When you look back over your life, was it that time that the, the surgeon stood you up? Would that be your big dot? Or is there other ones that you would go, no, really? When I think about it, that is the moment that the, the Amy Baxter, who I am now, really started to move on. Hmm. There's so many dots. I, I, I think that, that given where I am now, I've been doing Buzzy for seven years. And, and the big dot came when... I had the solution. I had made a a prototype and I knew that it worked for our children. And I was I was so filled with anxiety when I was in the emergency department and I would hear a child crying because they were getting an IV. I would I would see the staff laughing because a kid was freaking out and um it it, it happens um because staff feel like they're freaking out because of a, a tiny little needle. Who cares about a needle? But to the kid, it was worth freaking out about. And and I was very conflicted because I knew I had a solution and I also knew there was no way to run in with my little electrical taped gadget and go, here you go, I'll save the day. So my husband said in the middle of all of this, this existential angst, he said, look, how hard can this be? How many people will you help? How much time will it take to do it? Um, and how much is it going to bother you every time someone cries if you don't try and maybe it won't work and maybe you'll do the research and it only works on your kids because they're under your cult of personality but if it's going to bother you this much not to know there's an opportunity cost of not pursuing this emotionally and and mentally and so that really clarified the decision of whether or not to risk my academic career to risk my my practice to risk the income of not making the money I was making being a full-time doctor um, all of those risks were balanced off by the need to know and the need to be able to make a difference so I think that was really the big dot because at that point I decided I had to veer in a different direction and it made it a clear and easy decision rather than one that was um, complicated. Well, was it a leap of faith that you knew that you could back out of it, it wasn't something that was just one directional yeah it was total blind ignorance <laughs> it was it was complete naivete about how overwhelming deciding to be an entrepreneur is i have not seen any of the james bond movies with uh, daniel craig i have not had social currency in um in reading a new novel in five years uh, I didn't realize how how tough it was going to be, and I didn't take into consideration that I'm so stubborn that I wouldn't give up. So, um, and I think some of it was, as you say, I, I didn't realize that it was in some ways a one-way trip. I really thought that, um, that this could be a, a deviance and that I wasn't going to end up with a B on my tombstone. I think this is... A big tombstone you should have because it it is something that should be in everyone's medicine cabinet and and 
I will ask at the end of the show how people can connect with you, but I'm very interested how people can connect with Buzzy. So people out there thinking, this is for me, I'm going to get this. I don't care if it's the black one, the lady one, or Buzzy itself. How do they buy this? Is it sold online? Is it in sort of shops? Or how do they get it? So it depends on where you are in the world. Um, you can go to buzzy 4 shotscom either the word for or the number four, and, and look up international and see um, where Buzzy is. There is a buzzy 4 shotscouk that supplies Buzzy in the UK. Um, we're on Amazon in the US. We're really anywhere in the world you can get a Buzzy except for Canada. Why? What's the matter with Canada? It's very complicated. Um, they they consider Buzzy to be a class two medical device, which means that we would have to have a sterile room in our shop, even though it's not a sterile product, but we'd have to have a lot of different certifications. Our manufacturers have those certifications, but my premises actually does not have a sterile room in it. So um, it's complicated, but at this point, we can't sell in Canada. So in Canada, you might get black market Buzzy. <laughs> You know, um, we send cease and desists every week because they're popping up on eBay and and people are, are taking them over the border. <laughs> but but we try to tamp down on that and, and play the game by the rules. That's really strange, though, isn't it? Because you could imagine something like that would happen in, you know, like a third world country or something. So a country so different from America. But just across the border, you, you would think it's almost exactly the same. It's been an amazing education about what countries have different rules and how classifications work and um, something that is exactly the testing and the, the research that you need in Brazil is irrelevant in Singapore. Just before I put you on the sermon and the mic and send you back in time to have a word uh, with your younger self, what, what's the major thing that you've learned? When you're laying in your bed at night and you look back over the last seven years of dealing with Buzzy, what's, what's the big learning for anybody who has got an idea of a product and they're sort of grappling with how to actually bring it to sort of fruition? What, what's that one bit of advice you could give them? Don't be motivated by the payoff. <laughs> I think that um, ideas take between seven to nine years to come to fruition, whether that's acquisition or being um, independently functioning without having to take all of your life. One of the things that we talk about in one of my entrepreneur groups is is the day of obsolescence, the day that you're actually irrelevant to your company's functioning. That's the day of success. And so that day takes seven to nine years. And unless you're really passionate about what you're making, not just for the money, but because you're doing something that you really care about, I don't think that that derailing your life is worth it. I think that's the biggest lesson is knowing that when it when it's gotten hard, when it's gotten tough, when it's gotten frustrating, when it's gotten confusing, and when I've had to make decisions that I haven't been trained to make, um, that's when someone will send a, a testimonial saying that they've been able to start taking insulin now and they've lost 20 pounds and they were too afraid to do it before Buzzy. That's when someone will say that their child's allergy shots have gone from a one hour crying, screaming ordeal to five minutes of laughing because Buzzy tickles. Those things keep me going. And if I were selling something or making something that didn't mean as much to me, then it wouldn't have been worth all of the, the effort and, and going off the path that I started. Marvellous answer. Right, okay, let's send you back in time. And I'm going to play the music now, and this is the sermon on the mic, and this allows you to be transported back to have a one-on-one -on -one with your younger self. And if you could go back in time and speak to the, the younger Amy sitting on your step waiting for somebody to hurt themselves or the one being dumped by the, by, by the surgeon, what would you say to them? This is the sermon on the mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show The sermon on the mic The sermon on the mic Hello younger self You're no doubt very surprised to be hearing from me since podcasts haven't been invented yet and it may be a little creepy. There are a couple things that I have learned that I would love it for you to know now. The first thing is, do what you're going to do. 
Um, don't be put off or worried about getting distracted or going in a direction that's not one clear goal. I know that in medicine, people are going to tell you that you're not going to make a contribution to society unless you keep pushing in one direction and focus. But complex problems don't respect disciplinary boundaries. If you're going to solve really complicated problems, you need to be okay with following what interests you. If something's boring you, if something is is feeling like it's not something you care about, or if people are just making you unhappy, then don't work with them. Spend more time with the people that make you happy and spend less time with the people that make you unhappy. If you find that you're unhappy, then you can change something and don't be afraid to do that. The other thing, younger self, is that even if you go in a direction that's not where people expect you to, Stay true to what feels right in your gut. If you feel like something is the right decision, stick with it. People are going to tell you that you can't be a success unless you make something disposable or unless you change the way Buzzy's working so that it falls apart, so that people have to buy more and more. Um, blow them off. You'll make it anyway. It, it will be fine. But unless you can go to bed at the end of the day feeling like you are doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're making a difference in people's lives then change your path be really be really empowered not to be influenced too much by any one day or any one person or any one event keep moving forward and pay attention to what feels like the right thing for you to do um, younger self you might also consider getting some sort of a receptacle so that you can play podcasts while you exercise because <laughs> exercise is also something you should be doing a little bit more of. I agree with that totally. I absolutely, I, I think to myself, I should listen to more podcasts, but I'm so busy churning them out. I don't actually get a chance anymore, but um, yeah, it's all right. When, when she grows up and she can drive, she can play it on Stitcher in her car. She'll be fine. She'll be able to listen to you. Well, how do people actually connect with yourself, Dr. Amy? I'm on LinkedIn. I um, I have a, a Twitter account that's just with at Buzzy for Shots. You can write to info at mmjlabs.com. I named it for my children, Max, Miles, and Jill, but uh, MMJ in the States has gotten on a medical marijuana overtone. So don't be afraid. Info at MMJ Labs will actually get you to Buzzy and not something that uh, is cannabinoid. There we go. The, the last one of your vice come up in that show. No, no, no. We've done a lot. We've done drugs. We've done beer. Well, who, who knows? Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today, joining up those dots of your life. And please come back again when you have more dots to join up, because I do believe that by joining up the dots and connecting our past, it's the very best way to build our futures. Dr. Amy Baxter, thank you so much. It's been a delight, David. Thank you. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free, and we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.